All right, so. Hello and welcome to uh, today's webinar. My name is Trevor Smith Miller. I'm the uh, new communications manager here at CCSN. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, it's very, a very great topic that we have today. But if you're new to webinars, the CCSN, we're an organization, the Can Can Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. We're an organization working with cancer patients and survivors to learn about the complexity of our health system, connect with others to plan action and act on those plans to create better outcomes and healthy survivorship. Uh, if you want more information, there's a lot of information that we have. Please visit our website at survivornet.ca. Uh, uh, you can find news, you can find events, and also information on the various uh, different types of cancers and also the Science of Cancer uh, program, which is extremely useful. Uh, just as a heads up, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on YouTube tomorrow. And a link will be provided by the email that you registered with. So if you registered uh, with an email and you need to leave halfway through, everything will be uh, recorded and uh, sent to you by that email. Uh, now we will have a quick Q&A session at the end, but uh, if you would like, uh, the chat function is open, put your questions in the chat and then we will read them out at the end so, so that uh, any questions that we have during the time uh, will be uh, given, given the good credence that we have. So I would like to introduce our, uh, our return guest, uh, Dr. Rob Rutledge. He is a radiation oncologist in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He's specializing in breast, prostate, and pediatric cancers, and is an associate professor uh, in the Faculty of Metal Medicine at Dalhousie University. His passion is empowering people affected by cancer, and he has delivered hundreds of public talks and webinars, including uh, ones for the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network, along with over 60 retreats and day-long seminars to thousands of cancer survivors. Rob has received a Cancer Care Nova Scotia Award uh, uh, for excellence in patient care and doctors Nova Scotia presented him with a health promotion award in recognition of his contribution to physician health and health promotion in cancer patients. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Rob for when a loved one has cancer, 10 ways to support someone with a cancer diagnosis. Excellent, thank you, Trevor. I guess I gotta go right back to the top here. Slideshow, play from the start. Welcome everybody. It's always an honor to work with the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network and each and every one of you, me hats off that you're empowering yourselves, you're making a difference, that your, your love is coming through in practical ways for those around you who've had a cancer diagnosis. Um, and to our community partners and the professionals uh, joining us as well, it is a community. I want to start out with some definitions because I really think at our essence, we're all people and we shouldn't uh, pigeonhole ourselves in terms of our roles. And so what I would say is the person with the cancer diagnosis, I would call them uh, the loved one or your loved one would be the way I would refer to them. You know, some people like the word cancer survivor, that's fine, but uh, I prefer just loved one or a person who has a cancer diagnosis. You who have not had a cancer diagnosis uh, I, the family member, I like to call you a family member because you're connected. It's the extended family, you know, your chosen family. I also call you a loved one. All to say, I don't like the word caregiver. It implies that care is going in one direction from those who don't have the cancer diagnosis to those who do. And I just don't think that's how it works. I think it works in both ways. And in fact, being with a person who's had a cancer diagnosis can be tremendously healing for you in your life, you know, regardless of their physical state. So I just recognize that we're people, we're spirits first. Uh, and so I'm going to try to use language that reflects that. And if you work within the medical system, I would call you a healthcare provider, even though, again, we're people. People first, we connect at that level uh, first. So you as a family member, thinking about the person in your life, that loved one who has a cancer diagnosis, what are the goals? Well, you can help facilitate maximizing your loved one's chance of recovery. And if it's, it's not going to be a cure necessarily, so some people aren't going to be cured of their cancer, then you can aim for longevity. And what I'm describing today will be advice and a kind of knowledge and attitude that maximizes that chance of long-term wellness. I think people who have a cancer diagnosis and you, I mean, the loved ones um, often suffer psychologically. In fact, we know that from the studies, the, the family members have as high a rate of 
anxiety and depression as those who've had the cancer diagnosis, right? So it is tough. Like, let's just be honest with it. It's tough to be a family member. Oftentimes we feel useless that we can't do anything. We can't help. Uh, and we feel like uh, bystanders. Well, I'm hoping today's talk provides some practical ways so you can actually change that kind of perspective. I also think that, you know, you can also have the goal yourself and for the person with a cancer diagnosis to think more clearly, to function better, right? We want to maximize that kind of capacity beyond, you know, cancer treatment, for instance. And why do we do all these things? What, what are your greatest you know, goals and aims and ideals? What are your greatest values? And I think one of them is to be able to connect more deeply. And I think cancer provides that opportunity to kind of reset, reset how we want to live our lives and reset um, how we want to connect with others, that kind of relationship perspective. And so you can, you can adopt even a bigger perspective of like, here's an opportunity, here's life. How do I want to live my life? Um, so that, that is a reflection to start things out. This is what I want to cover. And I think about this is how can you help facilitate healing? Well, there's a few ways, actually. One is within the medical system itself. Um, you're going to play a certain role. The second one is facilitating that kind of healthy habits, body, mind, spirit. The third one is helping with kind of communication in your relationship and so on. The fourth one is probably modeling, modeling a centeredness, a confidence, um, whatever you whatever you value most. Like, like it's almost better to model the behavior that you want to see in the world than to try to change other people, right? And so one way to do that is through authentic communication. And so you have this opportunity as the loved one, the family member to have an influence in lots of different ways. And one of the take-home points you'll see shortly is it's super important you take care of yourself as a foundation to being able to serve others, and you know, particularly the person with the diagnosis. So you can empower yourself with this information perspective and a proactive attitude that can actually have a tremendous influence on your health and the health of others. I'm really going to try to encourage you to have that open, honest communication, right? When you model vulnerability and openness in the way that's appropriate for the situation, that actually allows the person with a diagnosis to model it back and it changes the relationship from, you know, oftentimes people silo and they are like, I have to be the brave one. I can't let my loved one know how I'm feeling. They kind of put up the brave front and it's just not effective in lots of different ways uh, in that sense. So, and, and please do take care of yourself. It's, um, it can be very tough, both physically, psychologically to, you know, to, to live through these, these times, uh, you know, some with a cancer diagnosis. So self-care is not selfish for certain. Okay. One of the things that I think is important is to be quite clear about how you want to live your life. Um, again, we always have this opportunity. We're always starting afresh. Um, and so I, I ask myself that question. How do I want to be in this world? What do I hope of myself? How do I want to be in relationship with those around me? You know, those are, those are the bigger questions. The issue is that we can easily get pulled away from kind of societal, with societal norms or external circumstances and forget what's at our core, what's most important to us. And so we keep coming back home to that. And I call that setting your intention for being the best person you can, right? And I see that happening in a few different ways. One is as a ritual, first thing in the morning, I do you no know, 10, 15 minutes of mindfulness meditation. And then I put my hands upwards and I'm kind of recipient to something bigger than myself. And then I say, say it sounds it like a prayer, but it's usually in secular language. Like, let me be helpful. Let me be caring. Let me be the best physician possible. Let me be a good teacher today. I'm, I'm remembering what I need and what I want, and I'm going to set my intention to do that. So that's as a ritual first thing in the morning. You can do it as you, you know, before you go to bed. 
going into difficult situations, imagine that you and your loved one are going into um, uh, a meeting with uh, your physician or finding out a scan result, et cetera, et cetera. How do you want to be in that meeting? How do you want to advocate for yourself? How do you want to be able to listen clearly? How do you want to be able to get the best care possible from the medical system, right? So it's deliberate, it's conscious. This is how I want to live my life in that circumstance. Um, and then lastly, in the middle of the chaos, so we're all human, we are not going to come to some peaceful, confident state that I'm describing, we're going to fluctuate up and down, up and down. And sometimes we are going to feel flustered, sometimes we are going to feel upset and overwhelmed. And if you can remember, oh, there's another way to be and to kind of come back home again, okay, yes, I'm kind of lost it now, but I can come back home in the middle of the chaos to what's most important to me. How do I want to live my life in this circumstance? Okay. What is your role? Uh, so you can play multiple roles between you and the person who has a cancer diagnosis. At, at its base, you know, you could be you could be the kind of the person who is the observer in some sense. I would call you the trusted confidant, the one who listens. You don't necessarily have to give advice. You just have to be there supporting psychologically listening. Listening is powerful in and of itself. Listening is therapeutic. Understanding, acknowledging, those are things. That might be your role. That might be as, as uh, complex as it is. You might see yourself as a partner, right? So, you know, two people canoeing down the, down the river, right? So you might be paddling along with your partner who's paddling. They may be steering more, you may be steering more. So partnership is a wonderful way to go at it. You might be the captain of the ship. And in different circumstances, right? You know, it could be an end of life scenario where you really have to take control of it. Um, but, you know, that could also be happening much earlier in the process as well. And so this is kind of this negotiated, understood idea, or maybe not understood idea, that the roles can also change over time. And I really believe that the person with the diagnosis should be the one who's dictating how those roles play out. You're, and in some sense, you're supporting character. Yes, yeah, sometimes you have to step up and be the star on the stage, but for the most part, you're the supporting character trying to figure out where you can fit in and how you can serve that person best because it's their diagnosis in their life, typically speaking. And yes, sometimes that gets transitioned into you having to take the reins. But think of it uh, and have that conversation probably even more importantly, like how is it that you want me to be with you? Like, how is it that I can help in this journey? You know, so we, having those conversations and again, recognizing that things change with time. I'm advocating what I call complete cancer care or integrative oncology. Understanding is the, is the first piece and you no know, hats off for you for, for listening to this talk right now. Understanding is super important. We're going to talk about getting the best care from the medical system. And then the empowerment piece, um, healing at the level of the mind, your mind and their mind. You can only heal your mind probably more so and then nurturing a spiritual perspective, right? So seeing a bigger picture, finding out what the purpose is, the meaning is living your life fully even admits the great difficulties that could be happening. Okay, so information. So that's the first step is try to empower yourself with the information. And so around the medical system, if you kind of and this is like a full talk by itself. And in fact, it's an ongoing process and it's the power of CCSN and other organizations. So you can learn from each other as to how to get the best care from the medical system. But if you understand how treatment works, what your, what your responsibilities are, you ultimately can make better decisions about the treatment and ultimately you actually get better care. Um, so you advocate for yourself if you actually get better care. Bigger, bigger picture as well is that I'm giving a kind of very generic overview. You're going to have to really individualize that advice. There is no one best way. Uh, some people will be quite reliant on the medical system. Other people will see the medical system as just a resource for them, right? So we're all unique, different strategies at different times, different personalities. 
I say, understand rationally, logically, scientifically one side of your brain, but there's also part of you that kind of intuitively knows how you need to take that next step. So you're kind of open to the kind of um, internal wisdom. Actually, it's all one system anyways, uh, but use both sides of your brain. Um, and things change, right? Diagnosis, it's huge information gathering, decision-making, post-treatment, there's often a meltdown trying to reorient yourself to how you want to be in this world and in follow-up, so on. Okay, medical system side of it. So you can definitely play a huge role in getting the best care for your loved one there as, as your loved one would wish. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is have that very good conversation with your physician or oncologist, because yes, they're tapped into the international guidelines and the, the, the guidelines for treatment are pretty well standardized across Canada. The physician, the oncologist is, is understanding your loved one's case very um, specifically and trying to make sure there's the best treatment, the, the benefits far outweigh the risks, for instance but you're having that conversation with them. And so if you understand, you can speak the language. So you prepare by researching and understanding your type of cancer and the system, like you know, listening to this talk will, will be very helpful there. What's the purpose? So to speak the language, because sometimes those docs speak in a complex language, right? You want to be able to discern what they're actually saying. Understanding also gives a sense of, well-being. I would, wouldn't say even control because sometimes you just recognize we can't know, we can't, um, you know, control what's going to happen. Uh, and that's the mature perspective is like to know what you can know, to know what you can't know, and then kind of let go. I've done everything that I can. Now I can just let go and just continue to do the best for, for myself. So you're getting better medical decisions and there's the non-medical side of this, right? So this is the empowerment piece that I've been talking about as well. When do you know if you're getting too much information, whether you've taken this overboard? Well, one of them is if you're burning yourself out, right? You're up at one o'clock in the morning doing um, you know, research and uh, literature searches and all that stuff, right? So you want to kind of keep yourself within balance that way. The other one is um, if you're getting conflicting information, between what you're reading online and what your physician is recommending. That's the point where you need to actually get in and again, talk to the oncologist. So you get that clarification. So you understand the rationale for the decisions being made. And ultimately, as I say, I want you to get to that space where you feel like you're, you, you're doing what you need to do. And then you can let go a little bit, like you relax a little bit. Um, Lots of great sources of information. There was a time where there were librarians at the cancer center who would help you do their search. The Canadian Cancer Society have, have um, noted the uh, contact info at the bottom there provides a very nice service in terms of uh, um, information that's tailored to your level. So the, both the website and the, the number. Uh, and then there's the national not-for-profits. Uh, I saw Melanoma Canada as, you know, you know, specialists in, in that field. And so you can, they, they have a lot of information that's specific and there's not kind of a profit motive there. Uh, so this is big picture, how to get the best care from the medical system. I'm going to go through each of these, right? Preparing, uh, you know, talking to your nurse doctor combo if you have questions or concerns. There's a lot more information uh, and services within the system itself. And then asking for a second opinion if need be. Okay. So you and your loved one who's the cancer diagnosis before the visit, you want to make sure you're clear about this, write down the symptoms, write down um, the medications. Alex, you want to have that kind of preparation. I like it when people hand the sheet to say, here's the overview, because then it's very clear and it, it makes it more efficient for the oncologists. Uh, and it makes sure that your story is consistent too make sure to write down your questions. And that would be a list that you and your loved one would generate together and kind of maybe even prioritize the top questions first. Now, what happens typically is your oncologist will talk to you first, examine you, talk to you about maybe some results uh, and then give an overview of what's going to happen next. Typically that blurb will cover 80% of your questions. Um, and we'll talk to, talk to you about how to get to the other 20%. 
I would also say that it's very important for someone with a cancer diagnosis to be accompanied by somebody else, um, right? So because it's stressful, stressful going in to see the oncologist, I, I suspect that people retain about maybe 20% of what I say in a, a single appointment. So make uh, a strategy, make sure you know who's going to record this, right? Written, or you can say to your doc, do you mind if we do an audio recording? And typically they would let you audio record right at the end where it's a summary of what's happened as opposed to the whole darn thing, which is mostly them asking you questions. Um, I also think that having a kind of like um, a matching uh, set of medical results in a file is actually helpful. Having that all in one binder together, sometimes the medical system misplaces those or the, the physician can't find the, the results through different software systems. And so you having everything packaged together, ready to go in hand is also very helpful. And how you do that is to go to medical records and they can photocopy your chart. You have a legal right to everything that's written about you. Uh, type thing. Yes, they would charge you 50 bucks for a photocopy, but um, you know, it's, it's something that I think is worth having. So all your test results, all the, the visits, the consultations, you know, everything about you, blood work, et cetera, et cetera, is, uh, is very helpful to have. Okay. So at the visit itself, um, it's important for your loved one, the person with the diagnosis to be open and honest about what's actually happening, right? So the truth around symptoms, the truth about how they're doing psychologically, mentally, et cetera, et cetera, because the physicians can't figure it out unless they're getting the full information. Sometimes the docs will speak in, you know, complex language, medicalese. And if you recognize that's happening, especially if you recognize that your uh, loved ones may be looking a little bit overwhelmed, I would stop the conversation by saying something. Oh, sorry, doc, can we just have a quick time out? I'm not sure I understand that. Can you re-explain that in simpler language, right? And hopefully your doc has the capacity to kind of to, you know, change it to the level that's appropriate for the circumstance. And I said, you're going to get a summary and then you stay and you get your questions answered. You say, okay, um, I have a few questions here. Let's just go through this. And again, if your doc is tapping their foot or, you know, has their hand in the door, stay, just say, look, I really, I really need to get these questions answered. So you're advocating for yourself there. Take notes and record the interview, as I said before. And then really important is to know what to expect right? If you're on a new medication or your loved one's on a new medication, what side effects are, uh, are part of that? You know, how bad do the side effects have to be? What do I need to do? Uh, you know, when do I need to go, you know, into the merge? You know, who do I call at 3 a.m.? There needs to be very clear communication about what to do when, and you can play a very important role in making sure we're following that. After the visit, I say, again, keep that uh, journal list of results. Sometimes one of the issues is like trying to pass off that information to the rest of the family. And um, again, you can have a strategy with, with your loved one, right? Who's going to share this? How are we going to share this? Is, a, is this an email blast? Are you going to write it together, et cetera, et cetera? Or if need be, if it's like, it's too complicated a family scenario, you can ask for a family conference so that everybody gets on the Zoom call or whatever they're going to do to to make sure that everyone's in the know as to what's happening. Remember, this is, this is the attitude. This is, this is the key. Your loved one, the person with the cancer diagnosis is the most important person in the room. It's the system is there to serve that person, right? And so we need to continue to just keep that mindful. How is it that we can provide the best care possible? How can we facilitate healing? And just have that confidence that that's where you're at. Sometimes there's going to be a little bit of a breakdown between the person with the cancer diagnosis and the oncologist. Sometimes a little bit of a personality clash. Sometimes you as the family member can kind of ask those questions, kind of mediate and you know, get that information uh, you know, with, with your loved one uh, there as well. So you can kind of do the talking. And lastly, um, right? So you run into these scenarios of questions or you're you know, not sure you need some clarification. Squeaky wheel gets the grease, keep on calling. Now, what typically happens is that the nurse who has 95% plus of the information can call you back and answer those questions and really kind of set, give, give you the reassurance. 
The nurses are also smart enough when they don't know to get the oncologist to call you back. If they're not going to be a call, then ask for an appointment. So, and if you keep on squeaking and squeak gently and persistently, um, you know, without trying to irritate people, then that's how you get that information. And, and why wait for three months when you can kind of call today and kind of clarify today, you know, before the next appointment. In terms of a second opinion, I'd only say it's probably necessary if there's been a total break in trust in terms of, uh, you know, your loved one with the oncologist, or you really feel you're getting substandard care. It's like, I guess they're both kind of the same thing. How would you, how would you do that? Talk to the nurse of the oncologist, because they almost always in Canada, there's, there's a nurse that works with the oncologist and say, look, is there a way to get a second opinion? Um, or talk to your family doctor, ask them to fax in uh, a quick little referral saying the patient wants a, a second opinion. Um, and typically it's not necessary because the physicians are, you know, just in terms of physical care, they're following the kind of guidelines. And the guidelines are now, I would almost say like national in scope because they're tapping into these international trials. So it's a really pretty consistent uh, care uh, on that side, right? So it's, it's really kind of a breakdown in communication that I would say requires that, that second opinion. And yes, sometimes it's very, very complicated and a second technical opinion can be helpful too. Okay, the other thing that I think people don't realize is that there's a whole other set of services within the medical system. Uh, and if you don't ask about it, your physician, your oncologist may simply forget uh, to refer you, right? So I, I'd say almost everybody should go see a nutritionist, have that assessment and uh, get individual, individualized care. But there's other, other teams here. You know, people who suffer lymphedema or arm swelling, there's rehabilitation, there's spiritual care, psychology, palliative care. It's like there's so many other teams that have expertise you can just ask that question. And then sometimes a doc will like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. That's, that's what we should be doing. Social work often uh, plays a coordinating role. And uh, how do you do that? Again, you ask, I, I'm suffering from really bad fatigue. Is there any way, anybody I, I should be seeing? Or I'm really having this worry about fear of recurrence. Is there anybody I should be seeing? So I'd always say, go to the expert, talk to the expert, try to figure out who the expert is in any situation for any symptom. Okay, I'll give you the two slide summary around complementary and alternative uh, care. Again, you would use the same approach. You, I would say use the science. What's the quality of the evidence that shows that some extra healing technique is actually helpful in what way? So you do your research and then again, you trust what you feel is best for you. If you're taking something by mouth or IV, et cetera, et cetera, you really need to talk and tell your physicians what you're taking because there can be an interaction between that complementary medicine and um, you know, the regular care. And lastly, I'd say don't forego the proven side, right? The conventional medicine is based on science, it's based on proof, uh, evidence uh, that benefit is greater than risk. And so if you're foregoing that, you're losing an opportunity. Um, and really the takeaway is there's no kind of home run, shark cartilage, asiac, um, you know, herb that's been proven to kind of cure cancer um, or cause cancer to go into remission. Yes, that happens. There are you know, spontaneous remissions that happen, but there's nothing kind of at a kind of population level to say we can do this and cause you no know, more cures of cancer. Um, most of these therapies, I think really do help in terms of symptoms like uh, fatigue, nausea, uh, you know, quality of life type side effects uh, of treatment. And so, yes, if that's, if that's what you're drawn to, I think, uh, you know, I would endorse it. Yes. There's the issue around expense, et cetera, et cetera. But bottom line is there's no kind of home run, um, medication that you're missing out on. Okay. Just cause I like making sure that people stretch a little bit. So if even if you're watching this video, if you can just stand up even for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, stretch, do not look at the camera right now or the video, look up, 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 reverse the muscles of the sitting muscles, shake out your body, stretch it in a way that's right for you. I'll tell you why in a moment, why that's super important. Um, all right, so empowering the body. Big picture is if you know that a health habit like 
exercise or diet or maintaining a reasonable weight decreases the risk of getting your type of cancer. And that's what you want to adopt in the long term. And in the same way, if you know a health habit like smoking or alcohol increases the risk of your type of cancer, you want to avoid that in the future. And it's a whole other talk around this idea that the cancer cells are developing from normal cells, turning into slow growing cells, turning into fast growing cells. And you want to kind of stop or even reverse that process. At least, at least stop that process, right? So you don't want slow growing cells that might be in the body to turn into fast growing cells. And you do that through the lifestyle habits amongst other ways. So, and you guys have probably all heard this, right? Exercise, exercise, exercise. I could rant for a long time about the benefits of this. So that's one place where you can help facilitate that, not through kind of a guilt mechanism, but by being there, by volunteering, by, you know, just celebrating the, the short gains around that. And the, the science is very clear that by getting that heart rate up, we're talking 30 minutes a day, six days a week, right? You want to build towards that kind of minimum that people even undergoing treatment would have more energy. Um, they sleep better, releases the happy hormones. It's like, there's lots of, you know, increased function. It's like, there's probably an anti-cancer effect in addition to all that better immune function. Um, the body levels around less inflammation in your body, um, which causes damage and priming on the cells and so on. So, and even there was a recent study from the colorectal cancer world showing improved survival, talking alive, you know, alive and well type thing 10 years later through, um, through people exercising more. So how do you do this? So this is where you can be the, the, the partner in this, right? So how do you get the body to move more? Think of it as activity or movement. You're releasing the, the myokines, uh, molecules of hope, they call it. So you're looking for opportunities to make it fun, right? You're going to continue on a healthy habit if it's actually fun to do. Making it social, maybe like going for a power walk together is, is a more social thing. It creates accountability creating a routine. Like every morning when we get up, we're going to go for our, our walk before we have breakfast, for instance, or as soon as you get home from work, boom, it's like, it's going to happen. Still need to do the work, I guess, is the takeaway. You still need to get the body to move uh, somehow. So movement is, is very important and you can help facilitate uh, that. Even people who are, um, you know, so sick that they're kind of in the bed, getting up and stretching, you know, you know, improves, you know, bowel function, improves quality of life, includes kind of strength and, and, and function. So it's just movement is, is part of us. Okay, news to some of you, something called sedentarism, as important as exercise. Sedentary behavior is basically sitting, reclining, lying during the kind of the day, the kind of non-night time type thing. And we are so at risk of this, right? Because of uh, you know, the weapons of mass distraction, whether it's TVs or computers or social medias, et cetera, et cetera, commuting. So just be wary to, to watch and now question how many hours per day are you actually in prolonged sitting, right? So, and how much is too much? Definitely if you're getting over three hours in a row of sitting down, that is not good for you. You've, you've lost all the benefit of your you know, 30 minute power walk this morning by sitting nonstop for three hours. You've, and it's because the biochemistry changes. It's, um, it's bad for you. It's the, the, the fats and uh, lipids and uh, I mean, just the, the systems that we don't even understand now, the chemical systems within the body uh, are not built for sitting and lying for too long. So the takeaway for each and every one of us, as you are able, right? Because I know some people are going to be pretty darn weak and can't really do this. Um, at least five minutes up onto your feet for every hour of sitting, every hour of sedentarism, you need to be on your feet for those five minutes part of it. And here's the some of the data. Um, all cause mortality, a 50% increase. It was actually a Canadian study. So right, let, let's say you had a, um, you know, five percent chance of dying in the next ten years. Well, that would be up to seven point five percent chance if if you uh, if you're sitting too much. 
as I say, it changes the fats and sugars. And, you know, doing the same thing, you know, we can put on more weight, higher blood sugars, and there's an increased risk of cancer. Remember what I told you, if it increases your risk of cancer, your type of cancer, then you want to avoid it after a cancer diagnosis. And so that's even for adjusting for people who are exercising and take care of themselves. Also puts people at risk of heart disease, diabetes. You no, know, it's like, it's not just cancer that can really impair your and your loved one's quality of life. So you want to take care of yourself on that side. There's an interesting study, the British Journal of uh, Medicine, I think it was called, sitting six hours per day on an ongoing basis takes 4.8 years off your life. And so that's gets converted into like 21 minutes um, compared with cigarette, which is actually less. So how do we do this? So how do you make sure that you're standing up and stretching and doing something? So we have some better technology, right? So you can set your alarm to get yourself to sit up. One of the things I think about is like transitioning. I might be doing my emails right now. And then I'm going to go watch a little bit of Netflix with my wife. Well, in between, so instead of just like, you know, emails boom onto the couch with no, no extra stretch there, I might like do the dishes in between. So I'm up for five minutes to kind of um, get, get the circulation going. Um, I like different rituals. So for instance, whenever I'm talking on the phone, I try to, um, uh, I try to stand up. So I immediately stand up with that try to walk the stairs. There's stand-up desks, right? So you're doing your emails, you stand up and you don't have to be standing all the time during your emails, but if you can stand up and down and remember it's up for at least five minutes of every hour. Yeah. All right. One more little stretch here where we're just thinking about all that stuff. Oh, maybe a few little squats on the spot. Uh, again, as you're able, don't, <laughs> don't fall over. Yeah. You can even practice celebration. Woohoo. That's good. You're learning. All right. Nutrition. So this is another way that you can facilitate. Think of it like you could be like shopping and making sure that those healthy foods are available. That's, that's a kind of non-intrusive way to kind of promote uh, this. Talk to an expert always. And especially if your loved one is suffering from some particular issue related to nutrition, right? Treatment of the head and neck or the gut diarrhea, constipation, issues of weight, right? You want to get the expert expertise. Always, always, always asking those questions. What do I need to do? Diet. It's not just the genetics and the damage from the food. It's actually the, the soup in which the cancer cells are growing. And if your soup is an unhealthy soup, has a lot of inflammation, those chemicals can not only cause damage to the cells, which make the cells worse over time, but they actually prime the cells to actually turn over. You're kind of priming cancer growth. And so what I'm advocating for is an anti-inflammatory lifestyle. So everything I'm saying here is around decreasing inflammation through the diet, exercises, anti-inflammatory, practicing relaxation technique, stress reduction, you know, facilitating a better night's sleep, all these motherhood stuff is changing the soup for your loved one. The other major thing to think about is that we have a hundred trillion friends in our gut, right? So those bacteria, which outnumber your cells by 10 to one, um, or is it a hundred to one? It's some, some big ratio. Um, they are critical. So they're actually doing a lot of work in terms of breaking down your food, helping your immune function, hormone production, the issue is if you're eating poor food, your loved one's eating poor food, you actually kill off species of bacteria. You don't want that. You want a nice diverse ecosystem of bacteria in your gut. And if it gets really bad, it, your gut can kind of eat away at itself a little bit and you get leaky gut syndrome. So the, the, the lining doesn't protect you know, your, your system from having all these kind of bad chemicals uh, feed into the gut. So you want to take care of your bacteria by feeding them fiber. It's essentially fiber is number one. Yes, you can have some probiotics, but it's, there's only like 20 species. I wouldn't recommend you continue to take a probiotic in the long term because you might be um, cutting back on the diversity of bacteria in your gut, right? So how does it help? So the antioxidants are mopping up the damaging and stimulating chemicals. We don't want the spikes in sugar. So you're really... 
want to encourage a loved one not to be drinking the pops and the sugary stuff because when the pop gets in, the, the sugars get into the system like that, it's a big spike and then insulin takes over and insulin-like growth factor and all these other factors are priming cell growth. So the sugary diet is not good. You want a nice burn, um, low glycemic diet where your sugar levels stay at a nice flat level, not the spikes up and down. You want to change the soup, obviously improves immune function, right? Dietary advice, lots of different foods from all lots of different food groups, at least 50% veggies, think veggies, nuts, seeds, the non-meat stuff, decrease the red meat, the processed meat. If it doesn't get into the house, it's hard to eat. So it's really the shopping is the issue there. The healthy fluids and fiber, no alcohol actually is one of uh, the recent recommendations or very little alcohol. You're avoiding the processed stuff. There's the healthy fats the healthy nuts, berries, cruciferous vegetables, right? Some of those are frozen vegetables that are really, really, really good. Everyone should be taking vitamin D. In fact, you should probably be getting a blood level from your family physician uh, to make sure you're getting your, enough vitamin D. Not other multivitamins. If you, unless your physician's saying so, and enjoy eating. That's the big four food groups in my mind, right? And so I talked about vitamin D, calcium from non-meat products or non-dairy products are, are helpful. A healthy diet can do that. So I'm taking my vitamin D every morning. I do a little celebration. Woohoo! I remember to take it. And that primes me to remember to take my vitamin D and my B12 every morning. Shopping is key, right? So you're planning ahead. So important. And then don't shop when you're hangry or hungry and tired. However, because you're um, willpower is down in that scenario and you're more likely to eat the junk, bring home the junky stuff. And I find at 10 30 at night, if I don't have junk in my cupboards, it's really hard for me to eat it. Read the labels. Simply don't buy that, the bad stuff. Here's the ingredient list from the oatmeal that I eat. You can see rolled oats, grouts, seeds, amaranth, hemp seeds, et cetera, quinoa. It's like, they, those are actually foods. If you don't recognize the name, it's like too much of a chemical, then you're, you're eating a chemical, not a food. Efficient preparation. I love this picture here, right? With the see-through containers at the front of the fridge, which makes it even more convenient. You can reach in and grab a kind of a healthy snack easily. So you create that big pot of something or the chopped veggies on Sunday, and you have that for a few days to go. So some planning, that's something that you as the loved one can do, right? You can make these opportunities for the healthy stuff, find out what your loved one likes, and then get that available and get the, um, the sugary stuff into the cupboard out of sight. So that's less likely to be taken there. Frozen foods actually maintain their nutrients. I, this one's been a godsend uh, for me, who, who's not a great cook right? Because I can put the frozen foods into a frying pan, add a little bit of uh, spice, and then I've got a very, very healthy meal there. Frozen blueberries, other, other one that I really, really like is very, very healthy food in your fridge. Again, you can do that shopping and have those available. Um, berries, the veggies, so the cruciferous, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Again, no, no green beans, peas, high in protein, spinach, cauliflower crust pizza. There's so many great options these days. Again, you can, you can take that lead role in terms of trying to make sure that the, there's the great options and then offering those when, when it makes sense. I don't think it makes sense to go cold turkey, although people do when they get first diagnosed. What I, what I want for you is for you to transition your and your loved one's diet over uh, months and years, right? By slowly testing out these different foods uh, and dishes and see the ones that you enjoy and slowly integrating more and more and more of those dishes into your, into your meal. So that it then be, just becomes that's, that is your new, how you eat. It doesn't have to be a diet. It's just like how you eat because you like eating that. It makes you feel good and your, your gut feels good afterwards. You have more energy afterwards. I do kind of recommend just keep, keep on pushing that kind of plant-based food food at every meal and just don't un, un, uh, buy the unhealthy stuff. In terms of maintaining a reasonable weight, I just don't think you should go there with your loved one. Um, I don't think we should have a scale actually. I would say fitness trumps fatness. It's way, way, way more important that 
you're doing physical activity and having a healthy diet and having kind of, kind of that, that strength and fitness than actually the numbers itself. Uh, so fitness is actually way more important uh, there. Sleep again, you can't force a good night's sleep, especially well, even in yourself or in your loved one, but you can facilitate the conditions in which is likely to happen. Again, here's this expert advice again, right? So if you're noticing that uh, there's a sleep problem, a major sleep problem and no real lack of function, then you might have to get into the expert there. Generally speaking, I think about sleep as setting up the conditions. So we don't want to be stressed and anxious going in. And so as, as best we can to kind of create that kind of psychological conditioning throughout the day, I think it would be uh, better. Um, two sex. I just got texted here. Um, yeah. Will do. I'll be. Sorry, guys, for the delay. This is the difficulty of, you know, being an oncologist and giving talks at the same time. So we do those things to decrease the anxiety, just generally speaking. And then there's actually a training uh, that happens, right? So you're training your brain to associate the bedroom with a better night's sleep. And the first thing is to get into a routine, going to bed at the same time, you're getting up at the same time. You can even set a lights out alarm. So if I'm going to bed at 10 p.m., uh, I can set my alarm for 9.45 and go through my routine. You can write down your worries and plans and then set that aside. It's going to be there tomorrow. You don't have to worry about it all night. You can actually just allow yourself to relax a little bit more. Get up at the same time. Uh, um, so you're avoiding uh, screen time for the last couple hours. The problem is there's blue light that's coming into your eyes. Um, and so even exercising or heavy meal in the last little walk can also kind of give you too much stimulation beforehand. If you're going to um, have caffeine, then you want the half, you want to drink it earlier in the day, right? Because uh, the caffeine is still in your system. Um, two sex here. Um, mimicking the, the sun's light, blue light, blocking glasses, exposing yourself to natural light first thing in the morning, right? To 30 minutes of light. So that primes the, um, primes the system. You want your bedroom to be dark, cool, and comfortable. You need cool because your body temperature actually drops off. If you're running into insomnia, you want to um, be very um, uh, you want to be um, getting into a different room and return to your bedroom uh, when you're sleepy. So that's that's the the, the latest science. Um, you can practice a relaxation technique. You can think of a peaceful activity. There is a whole kind of science around cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Um, melatonin, I wouldn't recommend, uh, unless you're you know, traveling in different time zones, dose is very low. And I certainly wouldn't want to take it chronically in terms of napping naps are good. Um, but, uh, you need to get that done before 2 PM or no 3 PM in the afternoon. So the problem is that you can, you can keep yourself awake because of it. Lastly, don't get too perfectionistic about, um, you know, napping and, um, uh, you know, taking care of yourself from a sleep perspective, right? Because if you get yourself too anxious, you're, you're not, you're not going to win ultimately. So you need, you need to be kind of careful and, and kind to yourself. 
practicing a relaxation technique is a whole other talk as well, but it definitely is anti-inflammatory and decreases immune function there. You can use a biofeedback monitor for that. We don't have time to stress, stretch, but I would say you can practice a stress reduction, right? You know, practicing a relaxation technique, um, recognizing when you are overwhelmed and out of breath. Um, look for ways to feel well. It's, it's normal to be stressed. Last, I just last couple of issues, questions um, that having emotional difficulties with the cancer diagnosis, whether it's with you or your loved one has those things, these are normal. These are expected. Sometimes they'll become exaggerated and come out unexpectedly. There's no best way to work with those emotions other than not to struggle against them. I'd say find a wise person in your life. Realize that emotions will change with time and be kind to yourself. They're so distressed, can't sleep. I would talk to psychologist. Um, how do you find that help? Talk to, again, your oncologist or nurse or family doctor. Um, and I think that's it. I just say you can have a tremendous influence in your health and happiness and in that of your loved one. And there's specific ways you can do that. And remember, it's really, really, really important to take care of yourself and, um, and, and let, let, let yourself be the light uh, in that relationship. So thank you for Canadian Cancer Survivors Network. And we've left up the slide here in terms of the contact information and, and all the great programs that you're offering. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. This has been a very uh, helpful talk and just not just for uh, people with uh, our caretakers, but also just for regular day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming on, especially uh, Dr. Rutledge. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, now, this uh, webinar is one in a series that we have going on uh, throughout the entire year. We actually have one coming up next week um, uh, that you'll find more information about on our website that's up now, and I believe registration is going to be up uh, very, very soon. Uh, now, for just a little bit of housekeeping, uh, usually you will send an email uh, to your inbox. Check to make sure your spam folder, if you want the latest updates from what we have, our newsletters, our anything else for our webinar, check your spam because we do use a, a third-party email service. Uh, and then add us to your contact list. Uh, so if you want to see all this, all webinar information is going to be up on our website, survivornet.ca. Uh, you can find all of them on demand, and so you'll be able to uh, get them uh, whenever uh, they come up. And again, this one is going to be posted uh, tomorrow, and the slides will be available as well. As well, uh, they will be emailed a version of this uh, in your inbox. So thank you very much to Dr. Rutledge, and I hope to see you guys again, and I hope you have a fantastic day.